brutal news for you, okay? You're going to have to get clients internationally or outside of your area, which is a very difficult feat, or you're going to have to move to some place where there's concentrated wealth. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Unix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running and managing an architectural practice that allows you to do your best work more often. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Have you ever been in the situation where you can't find the product data you're looking for? Maybe you're using the wrong search engine. Broad searches result in consumer products, out-of-date information, and websites that hide or don't have the information you're looking for. If you need specifications, CAD or BIM, RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up-to-date data you need fast. RCAT.com is free, requires no registration for users, so try RCAT today. That's A-R-C-A-T dot C-O-M. Hello, Enoch. How are you doing? Ryan, doing excellent today. Thank you. Excellent. So today we're going to talk about a mythical creature, something that's unicorn-like in its rarity, something that when I say it, people are going to misunderstand what we're talking about first because they're going to be thinking we're talking about business revenue, but we're not. We're going to be talking about personal income but we're going to be talking about the seven figure architect today okay so this is your architect what is a seven figure architect ryan this this is an architect who is taking home every year seven figures so that would be a million dollars or million pounds every year in their own personal income so we're not talking about a million pesos or no, a million not, rupees. Or a, min, a million yen. We're talking about yeah. a million pounds, a million dollars, 83,000 pounds, dollars a month. Okay. That's a, that's, a, that's a real salary. This is like, you know, big wig financier type of salaries. Right. I remember years ago. The 1%. I met, it's the one percent. It's the one percent of the one percent. Okay, it's really it's a lot. I remember years ago I met somebody who was they ran an insurance company, and they disclosed to me not in a, not in a, they weren't necessarily bragging, but it was we were just having a conversation, and they disclosed to me that they were earning eight hundred thousand pounds, which is about a million dollars, and my little brain exploded. <sighs> I was like, people, I knew people earned that, but I kind of imagined that it was, you know, celebrities, famous people, or, you know, they've invented a product that I've heard of, or they own a famous chain of shops or something like this. I, I, I didn't realize how mundane of a profession, like somebody who owned and sold insurance was earning 800,000 a year. Okay, so this got me, this, this is interesting. And I know that we've spoken before in the past about six-figure architect. And in most cultures in the US, in the UK, whatever it is, whatever we choose these kind of arbitrary numbers, there's something about moving from 99,000 to 100,000 that's like, ah, our brain goes, ah, we've arrived. It's, it's a milestone, yes. okay? Yes. It's a, it's, a, it's a numerical milestone. There's an additional digit on the end of it, all right? For whatever reason, culturally, we've kind of started to put these arbitrary numbers as, as milestones. It could be, you know, 150,000, 123,000, whatever, okay? But hitting the six figures becomes like a, a, a milestone for many architects in the early parts of their careers, um, certainly here in the UK, hitting a hundred thousand pounds is like okay, great. Now we can, you know, particularly with the increased living expenses and what's happening in the world's economy, having a six-figure salary seems and appears like a lot. Okay, certainly if you're not earning that, so that's one. That's one milestone. But the seven-figure architect. Okay, so much of the conversation in the architecture industry is dominated around how little architects earn and how pitiful our salaries are. And part of what I want to talk about today is just to change that conversation for a bit 
and to actually start shining the light on those architects who are taking home seven figures, okay? And both you and I have had the good fortune to sit down and speak with these architects who are taking home these kinds of, uh, of incomes. We've got more lined up on the podcast coming coming through. You'll have to guess which ones, who they are. We've got clients of ours who are reaching these these numbers. And I'm not talking about, as I said, I'm not talking about the business take, bringing in seven figures because that's an accomplishment in itself. I'm talking about an individual, one person from architecture bringing in seven figures, okay? So often when we think about super wealthy architects, we look at someone like Norman Foster, who perhaps got a net worth of a few hundred million and runs a, a business of 1,200 people or so, one of the wealthiest architects in the world. Or we think about um, Patrick Schumacher, the architect who was Zaha's number two, and when Zaha died, he took over the practice, and it was reported in the in the papers that he was taking home five million pounds a year as his as his salary. Okay, that's what we normally think of when we think of seven figure architects. Normally, it's star architects. They're owning um, a big international design behemoth of a practice, but I want to invite us to consider that there are seven-figure architects. They're not common. I'm not going to make out that they're common. Okay, They are rare, but they exist in the industry and they exist in different sectors and there's perhaps more of them than you might think. And, they're, and, I, want to have a, and, and I want to have a little look here and, and just discuss about some of the things I've learned from them, some of the things you've learned from them, Enoch, what are they? What What are some of the things that they're doing that other architects aren't doing? And I and I want to just draw attention that such a thing exists. So one of the problems that I would assert is that number one, the conversation in architecture circles is always about low fees. It's always about not getting paid enough. It's always blaming the market. It's always blaming the industry. It's always blaming blah 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 blah. Okay, and and we know, and we've heard, you know, we've heard the criticisms of education and how it's design focused and all of this stuff. Okay, great, we know it. We could we 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 could do podcasts on that until the hills, you know, till the cows come home, right? But there is such a thing as a, as a seven figure architect. They exist, and they're not always star architects. Okay, they run successful design focused practices doing fabulous work so yeah, one of the what we will say is they, they are firm owners number one yes okay so this is number one they are all firm owners okay i do not know of any seven figure architects who are employees i haven't met one yet if you are one please write into us we will have you on the show in a jiffy and um, we would love to talk about your seven figure employment salary but you must not be a business owner okay so this this also starts to create an interesting dynamic, right? Is that you know being a business owner, owning something of value, of value, owning an asset. This is where wealth begins to be created. Okay, so this is an important kind of mindset shift as well when we're talking about raising our own income. That ownership, assets, the investing into assets, whether it be your own business or somebody else's business or the accumulation of assets and not the accumulation of liabilities and things that are costing us money. This is a, a, a very important part of this conversation. Okay, so there's a belief that it's impossible to be a seven-figure architect. Okay, there's no no shortage of conversations of no way that's not that's not possible on TikTok. I have a story about that, Ryan. I I would I'd love love to hear it. Okay, so this is with one of our clients that came to work with us. It was about two years ago, and this particular client was doing some one to one coaching with me and bringing in typically the smaller practices that we work with when we're talking about maybe three to anywhere from three to 12 person practices, this size of firm. Firm owners are oftentimes taking home 150, 160K if they're doing average, right? Average. And that means they're still kind of at the struggle stage. They're kind of 
just a couple months away from bankruptcy if things were to stop. But they're doing well as far as architectural practice are concerned. And so the very was like one of the very first coaching sessions that I had with this firm owner, uh, just asked him, you know, how much are you taking home right now in the practice? Because he said he wanted to he wanted to make more money. And he said, Well, I'm you know, I took home 140 last year. And I said, Well, you know, what's a goal? And he said, Well, I'd like to get up to 180. And I said, 180? I said, Whoa, that's quite the leap from 140. I mean, don't set your so- sights so high. <laughs> I mean, let's not stretch ourselves here. <laughs> I said, what about, what if, and this is a goal after all, it doesn't need to be, you know, what if, what if, why not 250,000? And when I said that, uh, instantly, it was just, it was just like, there was, you could have heard a pin drop of silence. And, and this is what he said to me, and it was so telling. He said, are there architects that actually earn that? And he said, he said, look, I, I'm going to have to take your word for it. You know, I don't see any possible way that I could earn. Two, this is, we're talking not seven figures here. We're just talking 250,000. He said, I don't see there's any, that's just beyond my, my, my even ability to imagine. Because that's almost double what I'm earning in my practice right now. He's like, I, I have no idea how that would be done. He's like, I'll have to take your word for it. I don't even believe myself is what he told me. He said, I'm, I don't even believe you when you tell me. Like, I believe you because I'm paying you and you're my coach and you're, you're coaching me and mentoring me. He said, but I, there's something inside of me that like doesn't really believe that this is really true. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're just saying this to pump me up or something. You know, there's, there's doubt in the back of my mind. I said, no worries, no worries. Good, well, let's just let that sit. But I said, let's stretch it a little bit. Why not? Why not? Two, what could you stretch past 100? Why not 200? Right, so we set a goal. So let's fast forward two years. And um, uh, last last month, he got on a call with me and he said, Enoch, I'm almost afraid to actually tell you the good news. I said, well, what's the good news? He said, this year, if we keep on track to what we're currently earning, I will not only double, I, I will surpass, far surpass that $250,000 take-home pay that you that I thought was so impossible when we first started coaching together. So this year, if all goes on track, he'll take close to $400,000 in personal income and that from someone who two years ago was sitting and just wasn't even believing that it was possible like i said ryan so this this belief that it can't really happen yeah so if, if you if you you know if you listen to ryan and say okay ryan this is nice you know with the airy fairy this indeed sounds like a unicorn story you're not alone yeah right so, so and it's interesting right there's there's a belief immediately when we start talking about that and it, and the limit's low right the 250 that's kind of where people start to stop believing it's possible yeah right? that's about right yeah there yeah. was there was a tiktok um a little while ago of a guy of an architect called george atala and i think he's um he's based in texas he's going to be on the show soon we're, we're in conversations with him and there's a there's a tiktok show called um american incomes where this guy goes around and he interviews people and asks them how much are you earning and this architect just says, he says, millions, I'm earning millions. And the guy's like, right, you're it. taking home millions. Like, is that millions? And, um, and this, this, this video went viral all over the place. Oh, what really? Was wow. What was, what was interesting was that so many of the comments were, no way, that's impossible. This is not yeah. an architect. The architects don't earn that kind of money. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Da, da, yeah. da, 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 da. So just yeah. strings of disbelief. This is not real. Now I look yeah. forward to having him on the show and delving deeper into into all these sorts of things. But I I wasn't I didn't not believe it. I was like, we know, we've met, we've spoken with numerous architects who are in that seven figure category. Again, not stressing saying that there there's there's loads and loads and loads of them. Right. And their their designs there is, must be rubbish, of course, right, Ryan? Well, and exactly, this is the I next I mean, they thing, just do right? crap so architecture. Must, That's the only way. Uh, and we immediately assume that they must be terrible at what it is that they're doing. Okay, and this is often not the case. Why as well. is that? They're often design focused. Because profit and design don't go together, do they, Enoch? They can't exist Money together. If, you, can, if, you cannot do, you can't, you cannot do good design and make a shed ton of cash it's impossible yeah you can't you can't make money and do good design it's impossible (laughs) (laughs) or they inherited it or it's family wealth or they must be up to something shady okay Mm. so there's 
it's it's interesting and and I invite anybody who's listening to this now and you know just to observe observe what comes up in yourself just at the notion of a seven figure architect okay the disbelief it's impossible their work must be hideous they must be doing something that's destroying the planet it must be something gro- grotesque and shady and borderline legal that they're up to. That's not a practice that I want to work in. It's not about the profit. It's not about the money. Why would you want to earn that kind of money in the first place? It's not ethical to earn that kind of cash. Be aware of like all the stuff that comes up around that. Okay. So we're just looking again. We're looking at a seven-figure architect. When I say seven-figure, I mean you know. A million dollars or nine hundred and ninety thousand. I'll, I'll include that as well as a seven-figure architect for the purposes of these conversations. Okay, but this this kind of region of personal take-home income, an architect, and they're doing it from architectural services or from the ownership of ownership of other architecturally derived assets. Okay, so we'll 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 start. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the financial revenue streams that some of these um, some of these seven figure architects are, are taking home so I want to create the possibility here that there are seven figure architects out there they exist and that many of them actually do work that you would look at and you would be massively impressed with and you'd be like damn that works beautiful I wouldn't mind doing work like that these guys have got got it going on okay so obviously there's the the realm of many of the star architects will be fulfilling in this this category and there would be evidence that um being the principles of these kinds of businesses can can bring you in a lot of a lot of money um but let's let's have a look at some of the the principles that are involved in actually becoming a seven figure architect and some of the things that we've noticed and seen, some of the traits, some of the things that they do differently, some of the skill sets, some of the mindsets and beliefs that they have um, that, that, that we believe and we think actually play a massive role in these kinds of financial mm. accomplishments. Ryan, right. let's, start with, let's start with why. Why, why seven figures? Because let's face it, most, most people on this planet, uh, if you earn $200,000, uh, even a six-figure salary, you're going to be living very comfortably, especially if you have a, um, well, let me rephrase. If you have a second income coming nowadays to live comfortably in the United States, and if you live in a metropolitan area, you better be earning $300,000 plus. But the question is, why why seven figures? I mean, why not just, just distribute that to your company shareholders or the staff members, the team members, or charge less money, or why? Why, why seven figures? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> well, well, Brian, there, I, there's I, this. I'll, I'll, I'll have a little just think about this actually, because the yeah. because for for some of us it might it might seem so ludicrous and so ridiculous, and it's a good question. Why why on earth would you ever want to earn seven figures? Okay, and this is going to be different reasons for different people. But the why not is actually quite a good question, right? Because if it's possible, and I, I don't necessarily think that all the people that earn seven figures set out to earn seven figures necessarily. Right, right. No, right? absolutely they not. Certainly, they certainly had financial plans and financial targets, and they were focused on creating their business, and they were focused on doing good work, and they were focused on... Um, you know, providing value and service and negotiating and they enjoyed mm-hmm. what they were doing. And these things and a healthy mindset were the conditions that allowed a seven-figure salary to to come about. Okay. And I think Indeed. in today's culture, let's let's say, that there's still something about the million dollar mark, the million pound mark, which is a, a milestone it is an arbitrary milestone right but it's it is it's a, it's it's a it's a massive accomplishment and i and i want to celebrate that and i want to get into a culture of 
us celebrating it and acknowledging the challenges that people go through to be able to do that. Um, and I want us to consider as well what we, you know, what our life would be like with a seven figure salary. Okay. And to start looking at money as being not simply something that's the, the food of greed, but it actually is a great empowerer. It's a great facilitator. It's a, it's a, it's a tool that you can use and choose to do whatever you wish with. Right. It's very, it's very, very trendy in architecture right now to have a horizontal office structure, right? We have mm -hmm. no hierarchy. Um, we have open offices. I mean, every little, there's different ways in which this manifests itself. Um, yep. You know, we have transparent salaries or, you know, we all earn the same amount of money or we take the profit pool and distribute it equally, right? So there's, and this is good. This is good. This is good. This, there's sort of this egalitarian ethos in architecture. And that's great. We don't want to diminish that, right? What's interesting, what starts happening though, is especially around this conversation of, for instance, taking home a seven-figure salary, I know for a fact that there are many, many architects and firm owners who would think that that would be an unethical thing to do, that that would not be right, that there'd be something morally or ethically wrong or unworkable with actually taking home a million dollars. Let's say if there's a million dollars left over in the firm, who am I? Who am I to take that? Let's spread that. Let's spread that amongst all the team members. Isn't that a better? Is it, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Isn't that a better way to to you know, those people deserve it. They've put in hard work and effort to to, you know to make that. You know what's really interesting? It would be, a, a, I could understand the assumption that if, if you met a seven-figure architect, that they must be, you know, they must have minions working under them being paid nothing. Yeah. This is never the case. I have not seen, for the seven-figure architects yep. that, that I've seen their details in their business all of their employees get paid way above the average rates yeah way way yeah. above and they're very Absolutely. very protective over making sure that they have the best staff getting paid for the best rates absolutely all right so we're you know i don't know about the, the star architects and the, all that kind of stuff that happens on that's a you know that's another model but the architects that we've worked with and have seen and have had on the show and spoken with, they pay their staff incredibly well. And that's and that, yeah. that I would like to kind of start off actually as one of the first principles here is that they reward themselves and they reward others. Yes, and that goes back to it's a way of being and not just a way of doing. Yes, what do we mean by that, Ryan? Yeah. So this is a this is not just purely in in action, but this is a it's a culture of generosity. There's a being of generosity. There's a being of it's, you know, it's number one kind of understanding and seeing the business as a vehicle for wealth and taking that very seriously and if you're being generous, if you're, you know, kind of, you're being generous, the generosity is something that drives, can be used to drive financial acumen. And absolutely. And it becomes something very important. Like we want to keep improving our I financial like language, literacy, acumen, because I want to make sure that I've got the best team. A lot of the people that we've speaken, spoken to, these seven-figure architects, they do not want to lose their team. They don't want Absolutely. to lose them. Absolutely. They pay them. They're proud to pay them the highest salaries. Yeah, they're proud to pay them the they highest the salaries. They have the best benefits. They, they are training them and wanting them to become equity partners alongside with them. They typically have... A hierarchical structure. That's another thing I will say. There That's is often. Right. I mean, there, yeah. There's often a. There's often I, I brought a that up structure. earlier. Yeah. For for those who are questioning, you know, Harvard Business Review have done numerous numerous studies on the sort of the flat the flat management structure. It does not work. So good luck if that's the way you want to run your practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Flat. It, it it becomes decision making through committee. You know, often there's a very small leadership team involved 
maybe a two lower partners, maybe one main partner or two main partners. Okay, so that kind of leadership decision, decision making is quite effective. It's quick. It's directed. It's kind of like a benevolent dictatorship, if you like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there is there is hierarchy. There is there is structure, but when it's done well, as we we're saying, this being of generosity is one of ensuring and looking after team members. And again, staff welfare comes into into play. We don't want to be burning out our our team members. We want to make sure that they're paid the best salaries. And also, do you know what? If we're going to be doing all that, then you've got to be kick ass. Yeah, you've got to, it's, yeah. it's merit. It's meritocracy. Come, yeah, there and, you go. Come yeah. and come and play a hundred percent, and you're going to get rewarded for it. And they Absolutely. have active conversations with the team. What? How do you want to? How much do you want to be earning? I want to be earning six figures as a as one of your team members. I want to be earning quarter of a million figures as as one of your team members. Okay, great. We want to pay you that as well. But we need to get you there. There's there's a pathway to get to that position. Mm-hmm. Here are the here are the sixteen different skills we need you to learn. Okay, seven of these skills I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you how to do this stuff. Four of these skills you're going to have to learn by yourself. Okay, a couple of these skills you're going to have to learn by yourself, but we'll fund it for you. Okay, we'll invest into you. Right, but you come back with all these different skill sets, and we're going to be on the pathway to getting you to a figure that you that you want okay so that that culture exists in these kinds of organizations and it's uplifting it's performance based it's a uh, meritocracy and you know it is it's a it's a, a focused a focused environment so i think that's that's you know that's one principle is the the rewarding myself and the rewarding of others and inside of that seeing the business as a vehicle for wealth creation, not just for me, but for others. All right. The the other thing I, w- I just want to bring out here as a principle is Pareto's principle, and Pareto's principle is a law of distribution that was discovered, or the concept of it was invented, I guess, by an Italian econ- economist who was looking at who owned the land in Italy. And he discovered that the majority of the land, 80% of all of the land in Italy, was owned by 20% of the people. Okay, And this is a law of distribution that's not only found in land ownership, but it's found right across the universe. Okay, in in how matter is distributed and structure is distributed in 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 terms of like, a, you know, galactic structures to you know the in any kind of profession you will look at 80% of the income is earned by 20% of the people all right so architecture is not going to be immune from pareto's principle and i would assert that there is a 20% at the top who are earning 80% of the total revenue that the whole industry is 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 earning and even within inside of that 20%, there's probably another distribution the same, where another 20% of that 20% is earning 80% of that 80%. You follow? It makes sense. Yeah, what absolutely. I'm yeah. So you get down, if you okay. look at it, you could say it gets down to like the five and the 95, right? So yes. 5% is earning 95% of the income, or absolutely. 5% of the landowners own 95% of the land, etc. Yeah. Right. So, th- so this is, this is a, a kind of, a rule, a law, a, an observation of distribution of what typically happens with with income. And my invitation here is to is to consider, all right, fine, you know, we can talk about the ideals of, of flat and fair wealth distribution, but I would get interested in what is it that what does it take to be part of the twenty percent or the five percent? What's happening? Make this a make this a study. And if you're interested in wealth distribution, for example, then there's an invitation here to to look at becoming wealthy, and then you can distribute the money however you want to distribute it. All right? That's a that's a very effective a very effective way of 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 redistributing wealth. You need to get hold of it first. Okay. So absolutely, pre- yeah, that's a good point, right? <laughs> 
if I if I want to. Well, well, Ryan, I'll just have the government redistribute it for me. That way, I don't have to do any personal improvement or work on myself. I mean, that's much easier, isn't it? Right. Well, how's that going? <laughs> right. That I mean, you know, we can we this that's that's another conversation. Okay, but there's there's. I, know, just, I just threw a little time. I just threw a little bomb in here. There's, 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 there's mechanisms at play. I want to have this as an invitation for a consideration of, of you know, if we're interested in redistribution of wealth, then, you know, a businesses are pretty good, right? Um, well, yeah, and it goes back to, it kind of goes back to the question of, so politics aside, it goes back to the question of why should I, or why why seven figures? Why should I take home a million dollars? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean you should or you shouldn't, However, however, consider, as Ryan said, consider that someone who's shown themselves capable of earning a seven, bringing home seven, creating seven, uh, seven figures, someone who's proven themselves capable of creating an extra seven figures has proven themselves to be a steward of those resources, a multiplier, a force multiplier of productivity, a force multiplier of the economy. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting. There was an interview with Jeff Bezos. And again, I know that he gets demonized in the press all the time, et cetera, et cetera. But there was an interview with him not so long ago. And Except was, when I <laughs> sorry to interrupt, right? Are you going to complain about one except, of your Amazon deliveries? <laughs> yeah, except when I go outside and there's my package I ordered this morning sitting on my doorstep. But man, that bloody capitalist, I mean, he's ruining the world. <laughs> stealing jobs from the mom and pops sorry go on i can't help myself he 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 was he was um in an interview recently and he was talking about how you know his wealth is derived from his 16 percent ownership in amazon so his 16 percent ownership in amazon is worth a few hundred billion dollars right 200 billion dollars or whatever whatever it is that he's worth my mind can't even comprehend that okay that's 16 percent Jeez. That's 16%. And he made the point that the the remaining um, 84% of Amazon is owned by other people who have all, like, hundreds of thousands of other people are involved in stake and have, have got uh, ownership in Amazon. And he said... We have made a lot of people, a huge number of people, very wealthy. Mm, mm. I thought that was interesting because we forget that. Yeah, we forget that. All right. So there's, there's again. I know people will probably be in the comments writing about yeah, well, the Amazon workers in the factories and yeah, I understand. I understand. I hear you. Okay. So there's. And it's interesting because this this stuff gets it gets emotional, right? People have absolutely, very strong. Absolutely, it does. It does. Strong, it really does. People yeah. have strong opinions about about wealth, and and mm-hmm. have, like you were saying, there's some people will believe that actually earning that amount. Some many people believe that even the existence of a billionaire is a disgusting, despicable, immoral thing, mm. and it shouldn't mm. happen. Okay, mm. fine. If these conversations are coming up. The invitation is to is to is to look at them and inquire around them. Okay. So Pareto's principle, we've just used the example there of Jeff Bezos talking about, you know, they've made a lot of people very wealthy. Okay. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of some form of distribution of wealth by through the creation of the asset of Amazon. Great. So when we're looking at the business owners who were the seven figure architects some of the other skills that they're masterful in is that they love their business they love the business aspects of it and they are interested in and committed to learning about money financial literacy and making it grow okay and it kind of tags on to this other idea of 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 reward reward myself reward others because if you're interested in that generosity, then this is when you get really interested in the business side of things. 
And Ryan, when you say business side, you're referring to accounting and bookkeeping, right? Like they love spreadsheets and they love looking, they love just categorizing transactions and and bookkeeping. That's what you mean by business, right? Absolutely. No, right? It's, <laughs> otherwise, we'd see a lot of very, very wealthy accountants. And we're not doing the seven-figure accountant here today. But they that's part of it, okay? They all have an awareness of it and they have and they understand those numbers all of them without doubt have control and a reading a finger on the pulse of their financial health so they've got an interest they are not the ones who create the spreadsheets they're not the ones who are putting them together they will all have some kind of financial controller or an accountant who they work with closely who produces reports or they have software that they've got, project management software, sometimes very sophisticated software, sometimes just a sophisticated set of, of spreadsheets that they're using. But whatever system they've got, it works, and they track and monitor their money. They are interested in it, and they set targets, and they set games. They set targets, and they set games. Okay? They say, the business is going to bring in 30% profit. We are going to bring in... X million dollars revenue this year and they translate what that target looks like in terms of that means we need to close X amount of dollars of sales every single month that means we need to be talking to X amount of people that means we need to be having this much press coverage or publications put aside they gamify it they set a target there's a goal and the team works towards works towards it they don't always make, make the goals that they set but the very fact that they're playing a game of goals and they've got systems in place to measure project profitability, number one. So each project that's in their office, they know how many hours are being allocated, should be allocated to that project. They have a profit target baked in from the outset. Okay, so obviously most architects will set a profit target, if you like, when they do their fees in a proposal and then we'll never think about it again. The seven-figure architects, yeah. that they take that profit margin in the projects and they make sure that they protect it. They protect it. They look at it. There is a culture of here's how many hours we've got allocated on this project. They've found out ways to communicate and distribute those hours and resources amongst the team. And the team is held accountable and they have tools to empower them to be able to see how much resource they're burning through. Okay, so there's... And one of the, one of the cleverest ways that I've heard to do this, Ryan, which is something that we teach firms we work with, is just take that money, so take that 20% right up front, just, just take it off the table. Your team doesn't even see that. That goes into the company coffers for profit purposes. Mm -hmm. And then what's left... This is what we have to do the project with. We've Absolutely. already budgeted it. We make it happen. Absolutely. Park Parkinson's law. Parkinson's it, law, which states? Yeah, which, which states the amount of resource that you allocate to something is how much resource will get used. So, for it example, if, used, exactly. if, if, you've got, if you've got a task and you allocate eight hours to do that task, then you will take eight hours to do it. If you allocate mm -hmm. two hours, you will figure out a way Perhaps there'll be a bit more level of intensity to it, but you will figure out a way to get the result that you need in the two hours. We've probably all experienced this when we've haven't done anything for you know what normally happens is we don't set any kind of allocation of resource in time to a task, and it just dribbles out and it dribbles out and it dribbles out and it dribbles out, and then we've got a few hours left before the presentation is due. You spend a few hours and you're like. I'm not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that. And then you kind of work in this little fervor and you, you know, patch something together. And you're like, why didn't I do that at the beginning of the, of the time? We could have just, rather than spending <laughs> eight hours worrying about that thing and thinking about doing it, and then have this little bit of energy at the end where we're actually completing it. So this, this idea of, of, of loving business and loving money and um, being focused on profit and measuring profit and profitability is something that we've seen in all of the seven-figure architects. They know their numbers. They, they're not the accountant um, people, but they've got, they have reports. They have financial reporting, and they review them. Yeah, and they set, and yeah they it's set about targets. understanding like understanding money. 
Like there's an understanding that goes along with money, how money's made, Mm -hmm. just understanding money. It sounds simple. We're not talking about bookkeeping or accounting. We're just talking about understanding how money flows. Like you said, they're stewards of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're, they're stewards. They're, they're, yep. They care for it. It's important. Indeed. Yep, indeed. It's, it's important. There's, there's reasons and there's mission, mission and values around it. Yep. So some of the other skills that they've developed, selling and networking. Absolutely. Selling and, net, selling and networking. Now, having said that, they probably don't call it selling. Right. Pitching, in the maybe? architecture industry, we don't really call it selling in architecture, but it's like, it's like, you know, a bird. Educating. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. we call it. <laughs> yeah, educating. <laughs> That's what we've got to educate our clients. But they've, they've all become masterful salespeople. Yeah. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. There we go. That's the thing. <laughs> A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? So it's a different name. Whatever we call it, we may not call it selling in architecture. We don't. But anyone from outside the industry would look at it and say, that's selling. I mean, it may not be... Selling doesn't necessarily signify the flavor of something. It doesn't mean that you're being salesy. Selling is simply the process of an exchange of money for ideas or mm-hmm. product or service. That's that's selling. Yeah, Le- lead, yeah. Leading, yeah. Uh, leading a client or leading a prospective client to making an agreement for an exchange of you know money for services like that that process and nurturing Mm, those relationships yeah nurturing those relationships from the outset being able to position your business in in a way that's you know that's that's it that's that's empowering and that puts you at the top of your market and that communicates value so there's selling i'm put you know selling marketing networking so they put a big importance on developing professional networks, professional consultants, colleagues, developing those relationships. And they are out there expanding their network consistently. Mm-hmm. They are mm-hmm. prospecting, they develop relationships, and they keep on nurturing those relationships. Some people do this just as a function of their personality. It's who they are. Others you know they are introverted it doesn't come naturally to them it's not something they like doing but they know the importance of it and they found structures and ways and training and you know they've developed themselves in communication and you know they've invested they've invested time and money into the communication um the 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 mentoring the selling strategies topics discussions you know they've they've gone into it they've looked at it they've there, studied there's it, a they've mindset crafted. there also right there's a mindset of Seeing business development, like everything you just talked about, prospecting, business development, there's a mindset of seeing that as taking me away from the architecture or taking me away from billable hours. So there's a definite difference we see from the seven-figure architects to the six-figure or less architects where the six-figure architect thinks, I got to spend time on billable work. I don't have enough time to go network. I don't have enough time to go market because that's taking away my time to actually produce money. The seven-figure architect has a very different viewpoint. They say, actually, the networking and the business development is the best investment of my time because I know that that's where I'm doing $100,000 an hour work as opposed to $100 an hour work. Yes. Very distinct yeah. mindsets, very distinct ways of looking at at marketing, sales, and business development of these two firm owner types. Yes, absolutely. What's interesting, actually, is that the seven-figure architect, they recognize that their highest value activities are in the selling, the networking, the marketing, the business development, the development of systems and processes in the practice so that they can design through other people. And I, and I would, I would yeah. again, put out an invitation here that the evolution of an architect is in part relinquishing the pen. Now, many architects are going to say this is, this is blasphemous, what I'm saying, right? But I, I'm, I'm, I want to put an idea out of, of evolving as an architect 
means moving away from just always drawing and you being the person who's delivering the work to facilitating and building a team of people through which your design genesis or culture or manifesto or ideology lives inside of other people so that they can run with their own ideas inside of something that you've created. That's difficult. Or, or if you want to be that designer and you have to have the pencil and you know that's what fires you up and you love it, hire someone to manage the practice or get a partner who's going to be the managing partner, like at Big, Bjork Ingels Group, right? Yep. Bjork does not handle any money conversations. If you want to handle a money conversation, you have to talk to Sheila. She handles all the money conversations. Okay, so Bjork and his team, they can just focus on design. They can do that. They have someone to handle the money. You don't talk money with Bjorka. But but he's a master salesperson. Oh, he is. He's one of the, he's a masterful he's a promoter, salesperson. For sure. A prom- yeah, a, he's a promoter, a marketer, a networker, for sure. Yep. But absolutely, absolutely. So he recognized very early on in the firm's development, the need for a, a kind of focused um individual to be managing the business and again we see this in very successful firms that there there's a managing partner who is being a managing partner Mm -hmm. it's -hmm. clear they're doing managing partner positions what's also interesting is many of the seven figure architects they also have an evolution of being the managing partner if you like and doing these higher value activities and at some point it all starts to work and guess what? They have a whole load more free time. <laughs> yeah. So what do they like to do with it? They can do whatever they want with it. They can do whatever they want with it. And if that means for you to do more design work, great. Yeah, we'll I call that int- freedom and the, the three F's of the smart practice. Freedom. Freedom. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about. Freedom. I, I remember um, I interviewed... Uh, Uh, a designer and they were talking about how much energy and focus they put onto marketing and sales and building processes and systems into the business and got it up and running and they'd opened three offices and they were bringing home great money and they found themselves of all this spare time and yeah we have clients say that all the time yeah and and they and there's they're like oh wow what, what 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 do i do with it and what was really interesting was he was saying, you know what, I actually wanted to do more design work, but I'd built a team that was so good that they were actually designing better than me. So I didn't want to get involved and ruin it. <laughs> there you go. I love it. I love it. Love so it. now I paint. <laughs> Again, and the see, so for those, for those very savvy listeners who are listening to this and wondering, okay, how can I become a seven-figure architect? It really comes down to, at the end of the day, it comes down to principles. Okay, if you listen, read between the lines of what Ryan just said. And there's a reason why Ray Dalio wrote the book on principles and why Art Gensler he titled his book Art's Principles is because these leaders, so by the way, Art Gensler created the largest and most profitable uh, in terms of total revenue architectural practice in the world. And Ray Dalio runs... One of the Bridgewater Associates, which is one of the most profitable and successful hedge funds, investment funds, right? And so the principle here, when we look at the principle that Ryan's talking about, he talked about generosity earlier, right? He, right now he's talking about this idea of leadership, of leading your teams and leading your people, right? What's the, what's the underlying being or the underlying principle that these people have, seven-figure architects, that then delivers the result? Yeah. I used to hate right. that, Ryan. When Back in the day when I was like struggling as an architect or struggling to make ends meet and just wanting to get in a, a safe financial footing, I was like, just tell me the tactic. I don't want to hear that it's all about principles or mindset. Just give me, what do I need to do today? <laughs> but you just talked about relinquishing control. So this idea that I don't need to be the person to do everything, again, this is another one of the mindsets of a seven-figure architect. A seven-figure architect is not going to be the person who feels like they need to do everything. Yeah. Guaranteed. You will, yeah. you, will, 
you will not find a seven-figure architect who's decided that they need to do everything. Yeah, they're, com- they're, they're often very committed to creating a space for others to thrive. Exactly, exactly. Right, they can let then. someone else be the designer, like you said, so they can do art. They can build a team that does it better than they do it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's a principle. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk actually about some tactics. Because there let's are talk about very, some tactics. There, there are some, I want tactics. some tactics. Give me some hard, scientific, the, the, applicable. The, 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 For those the, of you that listen this far, you're like, finally, you're getting to it. I just want to know how do I become a seven figure architect? Enough with all the foo foo stuff. You guys are killing me here. So they all, without exception, have found profitable niches. Yeah, that's the number one. After hundreds of architecture firms interviewed, hundreds of practices that we've worked with, research, the most, the number one indicator for how much money a, a practice can generate and how much ease and freedom people have within that practice to pay high salaries, to attract good team members, is going to be the market that they're serving, the yeah. kind of architecture they're doing. Yeah. And not, and- yeah, and, 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 Again, when I say kind of architecture, it doesn't mean that it's all rubbish. Some of it may be uninteresting type of products like industrial stuff, meant not the most interesting thing, right? But other yep. design work that there are many, many practices who do amazing design work, who are making amazing amount of money because they're in a niche that pays well. So a couple, a couple that I... That, that we've experienced, that we've seen to be highly profitable can be education. So K through 12 education. Yeah. Uh, healthcare. Healthcare. You have to you have Absolutely. to do it right. You have to do it right, but healthcare. Um, what's interesting is probably a lot of the people listening to this podcast are residential. Residential is a tough market to become profitable, but again, it's possible. But you have to be working with high net worth individuals. You have to be doing luxury residential market. Yeah. So the, the so the residential is like the middle chunk of the market is tough, brutal. You know, there's all these other different types of industries and trades that you're competing with you'll often get um not the right kind of client who you know and and i i think the seven figure architect will exist in the middle of the market through developing a a innovative software and being able to scale a product so we had a client not so long ago and you might remember this enoch um who was catering to a kind of high-end middle middle market, right? So not not kind of suburban, but high-end middle market. And they had, I think it was like a team of maybe two and a half people. And they had developed a piece of software, which basically they went and they spoke to a client. Client gave them the brief. They were able to translate this piece of software, uh, use this piece of software to translate what they needed into it would spit out a floor plan basically with areas bang 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 here you go here's this thing okay that would be the first bit of conversation that they would have they would make some tweaks and changes and then they would have another piece of software that linked the the kind of initial layout plan to thousands of other pre-made drawings that they that they had and basically, they were able to produce a set of drawings incredibly quickly using these kinds of um, bits of software, which at the time were, were already fairly aged. They were like 20 years old, but it worked. And they focused on a very, uh, you know, the, the same sort of niche, went after big developers and house builders. And the speed and efficiency with which they could get the drawings out meant that they created an incredibly profitable and viable business okay right that's interesting this this conversation again principles and especially mindset shows up i was talking with an architect recently and there's this element called there's this principle called the thermostat principle or it's Mm. also called normalization that when we get to a new level of growth within ourself there's a certain element of comfort where we feel comfortable in that milieu milieu Okay, so for instance, I grew up in a in a middle class, probably lower middle class, United uh, in the in the U.S. Um, environment, 
uh, you know, people that I hung out with, etc. And so growing up, I was not I was not comfortable in situations dealing with high people who are wealthy, basically, people who are high net worth, right? And so we see this a lot of times, especially with small firm owners, is they kind of get stuck, so to speak. They don't see it like that. But what's actually happening is their mindset, the way they see themselves is keeping them. And they're saying, I want to serve people like myself. So I'm an average Joe, I'm a white collar worker, maybe my parents are blue collar workers, but I want to serve the I want to serve the middle class people. And they they have stories about this about it being a sense of serving and and helping people have access to architecture etc cetera, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But I guarantee if you drill down to the real reason why they're serving that market, it's simply because they feel comfortable there and they feel uncomfortable in a different market. So what we see one of the characteristics here about a seven figure architect is that they feel comfortable in the market that they are serving. So if you're going to work with high net worth individuals, you need to be comfortable in that market. A lot of times, yes, that means you came from a wealthy family. Yeah. Not just because of your connections, but just because you literally feel comfortable with These those are my people. Tribe. These are my, Those are my tribe. Those are my people. It's just natural that I should work in this industry with these kind of people. Yeah. Now, it, it's interesting. Some of the seven-figure architects that we have haven't necessarily come from the same stock or tribe that they are now Indeed. serving. Indeed. But they are deeply interested and admire, enjoy, love their clients. And, and and they have, I would say, venture so far to say, Ryan, is they have a self-concept that is confident and larger than where they came from. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they have a self-concept of themselves, whatever way they were raised. They got pa- positive affirmations as kids. They were well-nurtured. Who knows what happened? Or maybe they went through adversity and they understood that they could do it. Something happened in their past that led them to the point where they can say, this may not be my tribe. But I feel I feel like this is the place for me because I have a bigger concept of who I am. I belong with these level of people. And when I say level, I'm just referring to financial metrics, which is what we're talking about right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this also, these the the kind of the the high end luxury residential market, for example, working with the ultra high net worth individuals and the high net worth individuals. Um, there's a compound effect that happens here because once you start understanding that world and those developing those networks, then it's kind of like the, the, the vein of gold, if you like. You, get, you start to get passed around more and more when that's a network. But the real savvy clients, the real savvy architects, seven-figure architects who are serving those, those um, markets also ask their clients for business advice. Yeah. They leverage their clients, right? That's they powerful. realize these are titans of industry. They sit down, they ask some questions. Could you tell us about how you're doing this? How did you win that? What would you do in this situation? Okay, they, 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 they develop these relationships where they're asking and you know, there's, there's, there's admiration. They're, they get interested in that world. I it find starts that their re- mindsets, the way of thinking starts to rub off on them. Yeah, exactly. And and they become part of the group. They become exactly. part of the group. This is how they become yep. this is how they start to become trusted advisors. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They become trusted advisors. In, in addition to market niche, so as we're talking about the niche and in terms of the industry you're serving, uh, geographic location is also huge, especially if you are in custom residential. But there's a few zip codes. If you move to these zip codes or if you start open an office in these zip codes, I mean You'd have to be an idiot not to make a lot of money in these zip codes. They would be places like Silicon Valley, some zip codes in Los Angeles, some zip codes in uh, Connecticut, basically where there's concentrated wealth. I mean, let's mm-hmm. face it, you know, some of the most, some of the architects with the most staggering salaries live in affluent areas of Orange County. They live in, and they serve those areas. They live in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley. They live in places like Austin, Texas, where there's a lot of tech tech money, et cetera. Yeah, so cool. if, you're, if you're in Podunk, you know, Kansas somewhere, and you think that you're going to listen to this podcast and discover some tips about how to be a seven-figure architect, well, we have some brutal news for you, okay? You're going to have to 
get clients internationally or outside of your area, which is a very difficult feat, or you're going to have to move to some place where there's concentrated wealth. Yeah. That's, that's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, these residential markets, understanding where wealth is, where it moves, where it resides, and starting becoming a student of it. You've got to be, you've got to be interested in it. Otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Doesn't. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does, does not happen. Great. So there's the high end, ultra high net worth market. Again, we see this in London, you know, Belgravia, certain parts of West London, that's mm -hmm. often way more affluent than other parts of other parts of town. You know, sometimes we've seen clients do very well where they've found pockets of affluence that are just outside of London, but they're not being they're being underserved by the London architects. Okay, mm -hmm. so those are quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So pockets of affluence and you know new new wealth um, communities that are emerging and then if you get in there early you can um, you know you can you can dominate a market and certainly get into a very good um, a very good positioning and Ryan on that there's there's a fallacy there's a fallacy that I've heard before that when like I'm not going to go into that market because it's already there's a lot of competition there. It's already very well served. But this is actually in business. This is a fallacy. This is a myth because you want to go into the markets where there's the most competition because that means the markets are there's money there in that market. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do is to try to invent some market where there's no demand for it. Right. So this is why moving to a geographical area, if you're interested in being a seven figure architect and you want to do residential work, well, you better move to Austin, Texas, go move to Dallas, go set up shop in Houston, go live in San Jose or, or Mountain View or, or, you know, any of the Bay Area cities, um, go live in Connecticut, you know, go, go live in Palm Beach. You know, there's a few of these the areas in the United yeah. States. Was that Ryan? The Hamptons. The Hamptons. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because there's always, although those those areas are already very well served and there's a lot of competition there, you don't, you just need a very, very small piece of that pie. You just, exactly. Like, a little, little slice, a little, a little nibble. A little piece and then there's the vein. Piece. Yeah. There's the and vein. it's much easier doing that. This is the principle. It's much easier doing that than being in another middle market, maybe not so profitable niche because you're still going to have that competition guarantee it because many architects have, they don't have they're they're just scared to move into those other markets, so they have reasons or excuses why they can't serve that clientele or why those kind of projects aren't suitable for them, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, absolutely. Great. We have on here the list, Ryan. We have emotional intelligence. So I would throw this into the tactic category. Well, I, I, I mean, just before we move on for that, I was I was going to okay. put in as well the profitable niche. I'd also yes. put being your own client. Ah. Oh. Good, good point. So you could be a developer. You could self-initiate projects. Yes. Yeah. Yep. There's more of a long burn strategy, right? It takes you can listen to the uh, episode Ryan did with Jared De La Valle, um, Alloy. Uh, fantastic interview. Talked about how he is now doing some incredible work as a developer. But it took years. It took a lot of hard hard work, a lot of hustle, a lot of years um, reinvesting money in the practice. It's not a it's not an easy road. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. But that's, you know, again, I think some of the wealthiest architects, you've got Jonathan yeah. Siegel as well, and yeah. Roger Solosevich here in the UK. Yeah. And, uh, the, and, uh, and this is definitely an aspiration of many, many architects to be client free or be their own, to be their own architect. And again, yeah. guess what? It's the same skills that are needed, even more so mm. in this world. Yeah. Yep. Selling, marketing, networking, communicating. Emotional intelligence, which we'll talk about now. Yep. Leadership. Yep. All of those, all of those skills come into, uh, into you know, into into big play here. Great. So, leadership and emotional intelligence. Good. You said you would, you, yeah. You put that into a, a tactic. I would. I would because and now it is a principle, of course, emotional intelligence. But the beautiful thing about it is, emotional intelligence can be learned. And there's almost yeah. nothing that's more important to building a team because when we're talking about being a seven-figure architect, it's going to be a lot easier. Most seven-figure architects have a team of trusted people behind them, so they built a team around them. To build people who want to stay with you, 
it takes emotional intelligence. So if you find that you have high turnover, if you find you can't attract people, it's sort of like the guy that walks into the uh, the restaurant and has the BO but no one notices. <laughs> like if you've been unable to build a team, you have you have basically the the equivalent of of emotional intelligence body odor. <laughs> you may not know it. You may wonder, why can't I build a team? I've tried again and again. Well, it's simply because you don't make people feel good and get good results, and so they leave. That's all there is to it. Simple yeah. as that. Leadership. This is why we put this at number two. Number one, we would say is the the niche number two right up next to it would be your leadership ability, your emotional intelligence, which basically means to get results out of people while helping them feel good about themselves, so yeah. helping them feel self-actualized. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think part of this as well is being able, you know, the emotional touch is, be a, is being able to create a compelling vision for your own business and also help nurture other people's vision not for themselves and for their own lives. For themselves and their own lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. You know, in terms of tactics, I would think those would be, all the other tactics were are just kind of getting into nitpicky, but if we looked at the big levers, those are the two that come to my mind, Ryan, and this is what we talked about beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, there may be a couple that are right behind those, but the number one, the number one and number two would definitely be the market you're serving, the geographic area you live in. So that's sort of the niche. The number two would be your ability to have emotional intelligence and work with people and build teams, just the whole leadership conversation, which goes back to emotional intelligence. Yeah, that ability to be able to design through other people. Yeah, absolutely. Build through other yeah. people. This is moving into the into the mindset of the business owner, not the self-employed. That's if right. Used the, yeah. If we use the, the rich dad, poor dad cash flow quadrant, which we've spoken about on the show before. Yeah. I, I love, you know, here at Business of Architecture, we talk a lot about systems and processes. And of course, a smart practice we teach and we help you implement systems in the practice to be able to give you more freedom. And what's interesting is like most people that come to us, they that's what they want. And understandably so. They're like, I just need some systems. The reason why my practice isn't easier, why I don't have more free time is because I just don't have the right systems. Right, I need some processes in the practice. But here's here's the truth. The truth is if you have rock star A caliber people, you don't need a whole lot of systems. The reason why McDonald's is famous for having developed this like assembly line franchise systems with all these manuals and specifications and how many pickles go on a hamburger and the exact order in which the hamburger goes down the line is because they're working with freckle, uh, you know, pimple-faced 15-year-old, 16-year-old teenagers. Yeah. Right. In an architectural practice, you're never going to be able to build a practice off the back of some systems and processes. It's like having the most amazing samurai sword, but not knowing how to do sword play. You're going to chop off your own leg. So seven figure architects, surprisingly, they, they might not necessarily have the most dialed in systems and processes, but what they do have is they have the team and people behind them that don't need the systems and processes. Mm -hmm. There yeah. you go. Yeah. There's a little counterintuitiveness for you. I love All it. right, Ryan. I, I love it. And then, what I else? Mean, How should we wrap this up? My man, or, or is there anything well, else you wanted I, to I, add? I don't want to cut it short, but. No, I mean, I mean, there is, there's other things. I mean, we could talk about drive and hunger, and you know, we've Ambition. spoken about self, self, self belief, and just like you know, having a strong sense of of vision. But you know, really, the leadership and the emotional intelligence can't stress this enough because it's the emotional intelligence, not just with other people, but with yourself, and understanding yourself, and understanding how to move yourself into doing things that are difficult or uncomfortable, that that are, where you're fearful of. It's mm -hmm. emotional intelligence about your own relationship to money and to finance and to, you know, basically you're the steward of your own internal governance. You only, you've got a good understanding of your thoughts and your kind of habitual ways of thinking and your, you know, you recognize these as constraints and, you know, all of this type of stuff. But this leadership and emotional intelligence, this is what enables people to be able to build high performance teams where we can get a lot of stuff done. And as you say, we, we can easily just think that it can be solved with some systems. 
technology can make a big can certainly make a big you know have a big impact right and just having well trained people but your people and having them well coordinated and enthused and committed to your vision and your ability to sustain that energy to keep people in that space fantastic seven figures here we come beautiful so what's the path if someone wants to learn these skills if they want to be able to acquire these mindsets if they want a proven path where they don't i mean they could go out there read all the books attend all the seminars invest in all the personal development um you know hire a whole team of consultants figure all, all this out on their own could do that that's that's one path or i think there's a there's a program it's called the smart practice method indeed it might yeah, be you worth could, you could come come join business of architecture leverage our knowledge uh and help us help you right one of the things that you'll learn in smart practice that we teach firm owners isn't just the systems but it's actually what we call a people operating system so it's a way to operate with your people and your teams such that you need less systems so that everything gets you know everything is functioning from a much more efficient and smooth way because you have this is something that most business owners don't even know about but actually having a people operating system Love it. So, Ryan, of course, if people want to go find out more about Smart Practice Method, go to smartpracticemethod.com. It's our 12-month or beyond program for architectural practice owners who want to build a practice that suits their life, who wants to build a practice where the business doesn't get in the way of the architecture so they can do their best work more often and make a seven-figure salary on top of it to boot. We want to create more seven-figure architects. That's our mission. We do. Help us help you become a seven-figure architect. Go to smartpracticemethod.com. Okay, Ryan. Man. We look forward to hearing your... If you're a seven-figure architect, you want to come here on the podcast and talk about it, we'd love to have you on here. And uh, maybe this is a little mini, mini, mini segment we'll do. This is like our seven-figure architect spotlight. Get some of these architects to come out of the closet and uh, share share their success with us. Absolutely. Change the narrative. Seven-figure architects. That was the... Yeah. We have, a, we, have a, we have a little show. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Enoch. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah. One more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Have you ever been in the situation where you can't find the product data you're looking for? Maybe you're using the wrong search engine. Broad searches result in consumer products, out-of-date information, and websites that hide or don't have the information you're looking for. If you need specifications, CAD or BIM, RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up-to-date data you need fast. RCAT.com is free, requires no registration for users, so try RCAT today. That's A-R-C-A-T dot C-O-M. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.